I stupidly thought I ought to tell Sabina. The following day I went to the kitchen at noon, when she usually got up. I waited for her impatiently. When she came in, I told her, I have something really urgent to tell you. As soon as Sabina looked at me, I realized I hadn't chosen the best day to reveal my discovery to her. She looked at me, but saw Louisa. If it's about Ted again, save it. I'm busy, she said. It's not about me and Ted. It's about Tina and Ted, I said insistently. You'll have to tell me about it sometime, she said, and yawned. I was horrified. It was Sabina the prostitute talking to one of her buyers, coldly, indifferently, absently. Sabina, I shouted. There's a funny relationship between them. I'm not imagining it. It's only funny where you come from, she said contemptuously. To him, she's a fully developed person. That must be very funny to you, because where you come from, she'd be a thing, a pet, a child. What a funny relationship, a man and a pet. But why does it bother you? Aren't all relationships funny where you came from? I got mad. I'm sorry to take up your valuable time. I'm sorry to bother you with my funny sensibilities, I said sarcastically. Don't ever apologize for your sensibilities, Sophia. Develop them. Refine them. They're all you've got. And then adding, see you around, she vanished. I sat in the kitchen, biting my lip with frustration. What in the world could I make out of any of that? You would have been a great help just then, Yarostan. Didn't you tell me that Sabina's world was completely familiar to you? That you felt perfectly at home there? I didn't know what to think. Was Sabina simply indifferent? Did she simply not care what happened to seven-year-old Tina? Or did she know all about Ted and Tina, everything conceivable and inconceivable? And did her philosophy account for it all as normal, as part of the process of healing? And were my sensibilities right after all? Or was I one of those who only know love and sex in the form of practice by the maimed, by those with stunted imaginations and dead desires? And even if my sensibilities were right, was I right to want to impose them on the other people in the house? Who was I after all? In terms of experience, and in almost every other way as well, I was the youngest person in the house, the only real child there. I was Tina's apprentice. I wasn't her guardian, but her charge. She was my teacher and my model. It was she who defined my day's activities, not I hers. It was I who turned to Tina to ask, what should I do next? That relationship was funny too, where I came from. That afternoon, I rejoined Tina in the workshop as her apprentice. Outwardly, everything remained the same, but inwardly, I was transformed. I stopped my flirtation with Jose and forgot the urgent questions I'd wanted to ask him. I turned all my attention to Ted. I accompanied Tina when she went to tell Ted she was stuck with a problem, and asked for his advice. They discussed the problem like two explorers setting out into uncharted territory. They were the adults. I was the child. They obviously knew what they were doing. I was completely lost. I became obsessed with a desire to take a trip, if only a brief trip, out of Sabina's world and its funny relationships. I longed to see how it all looked from outside, from where I came from. I hadn't called Alec or any of my university friends since the day I had been evicted from the co-op three weeks earlier. I had simply disappeared. I wondered if they too would present me with the child I had mothered and ask me why I had abandoned it. Surely not after only three weeks. It was Saturday evening, Alec's habitual date night. The school year had just ended. If Alec and I hadn't been expelled, we'd both be college graduates. I wondered if he'd be dating someone that night, perhaps someone I didn't know. I couldn't imagine him without a woman. But he was home and excited to the point of hysteria. He obviously wasn't dating anyone else. For Christ's sake, Sophie, where the hell have you been? He shouted. Everyone's looking all over for you, even your mother. My what? I asked. Minnie and I found her through the phone book thinking she'd know where you were, but even she hadn't heard from you. What the hell happened? When can I see you? How about tomorrow morning, breakfast time, I suggested. You'll come over, he asked. I almost consented, but a brilliant idea flashed through my mind. Why don't you come here, I asked. I gave him the address and insisted, don't tell anyone where I am and come alone, understand? I thought my idea was brilliant because Alec's visit would bring the world I came from right into the midst of Sabina's world. That way I'd see how I looked from the outside much more vividly than I ever could if I went outside. On Sunday morning, I got up before sunrise, panicky with anticipation. Alec didn't come until nine. I ran to the garage when I heard a knock, but Vic was there before me. Alec had gotten all dressed up in his Saturday night date suit. He looked as frightened as a rabbit that's ready to bolt away. Vic refused to let him in. Ain't no cop going to get inside here, Vic grumbled. He's no cop, he's my best friend, I shrieked. I threw my arms around the scared rabbit and kissed him. 
Then I led him past Vic through the messy garage, through the plush hallway with its panels and inset pictures and sculptures to the kitchen. Tissy was the next member of the welcoming committee. Cripes, what's that you're bringing in here? Tissy asked, almost dropping her cup. Tissy, this is my friend Alec, I said. Alec? That's short for Alexandra, ain't it? She asked. Tissy, don't be mean, I begged. Can't tell from the looks these days, she exclaimed vengefully. Don't worry, sis, I'm through here. I won't spoil anything for you. She left us alone. Poor Alec still looked like he wanted to get away as quickly as possible. He paced back and forth and asked, couldn't we have breakfast out someplace? I finally succeeded in pushing him down into a chair and told him, I wanted to see you right here. Looking suspiciously at me, then at the hallway, Alec asked with unambiguous hostility, what the hell you got into, Sophie? A whorehouse? I couldn't keep myself from laughing. Alec's words were like gusts of air from the world I'd come from. Gusts of foul air. Farts. Alec and I had never talked about prostitutes, but I'm sure he'd have set forth the standard radical views of them. Guiltless victims of a predatory society, exploited by the bourgeoisie like the rest of the working class, basically proletarian, until the day when he finds his girlfriend among sluts in a whorehouse. Alec disappointed me. I'd expected him to lean over backward with hypocritical understanding and sympathy, even encouragement. I would then have bombarded him with revelations about the negative aspects of the good life. But his instant hostility put me on the defensive immediately. A whorehouse, I asked. I thought you knew I was evicted from the whorehouse. Or didn't you know my colleagues at the co-op were all for sale to anyone willing to buy them? The city, the state, any corporate bureaucracy, any academic bureaucracy, law firms, rich husbands, even cops. I get the point, Sophie, he said contritely. I didn't mean to come on like that. But ever since you told me to be hush-hush about where you were, and what with that guy stopping me at the door, I thought, you thought I'd become a prostitute, I cut in. I didn't say that, he insisted. But you thought it, I said. Get off it, Sophie, he begged. You can't read my mind, and I can't read yours. So tell me what you've been doing, and I'll stop trying. You told that guy I was your best friend, but you sure don't act like you believe that. All right, comrade, you asked for it, I announced, proceeding defensively every step of the way. I've gone back to the working class, which is where I started, where I found my first love, and where I've never been, only I never expected you to throw that in my face, he exclaimed. I'm answering your question, I said calmly. I'm an apprentice mechanic, carpenter, and welder. In a few days, I start out as apprentice machinist and later on as electrician, plumber. Oh, get off it, Sophie, he said, annoyed. I know you can't be all those things. What's the big secret you're keeping from me? I was annoyed, too. For once, I wasn't being sarcastic, and as a result, I sounded like a liar. I grabbed him by the wrist and dragged him downstairs to the workshop. You don't believe me? I'll show you. Like a magician performing a trick, I showed him a rectangular block, inserted it into the lathe, and transformed it into a cylinder. I didn't know how to do anything else on the lathe, but Alec had never seen that done. He was greatly impressed. Jesus, Sophie, is this a school, he asked, now all modesty and admiration. I gleamed in his admiration, proudly absorbing credit for what I had neither conceived nor built nor helped maintain. Something like a school, I answered, but so different from the schools we know that it shouldn't be called by the same name. The state doesn't pay for it, and professional educators don't run it. Who does, then, he asked, exactly who you thought ran it. It was founded by street people, lumpen, whatever you choose to call them. Professional hustlers, prostitutes, dope dealers, pimps, and thieves. The works. They pay for it by stealing and hustling, and they run it themselves. They're the freest people I've known. They sell less of their time, their bodies, and their talents than anyone I've ever been with. It's a school, but there's no curriculum and no structure. Everyone does exactly what he or she pleases. As I talked, Ted and Tina walked into the workshop. Alec exclaimed, Jesus, this place is great. I didn't think such things were possible. Are there kids here, too? Tina planted herself in front of Alex and asked, Are you Sophia's professor friend? Suddenly, Ted faced Alec and asked, What's great here, mister? The heroine? The prostitution? Heroine? Alec asked, backing away from Ted. Jesus, I don't know, buddy. She was just telling me. Pointing his finger at Tina, Ted asked, Is it great for her, mister? I heard you say this place was great. Is it great for her? You hear my question? Sure, I heard you, buddy, Alex said. I never said heroine was great. It ain't great for her, mister. She ain't into it. And what she's into don't need this place. Her and me either. What her and me are into don't need to be built on heroin or prostitution. This place ain't great for her and me. I heard her and me, her and me, over and over, louder and louder, like a sledgehammer pounding in my brain. I felt myself sinking. 
Alec must have caught me because I suddenly found all three of them carrying me upstairs. I asked to be placed in a kitchen chair. I sat and stared, oblivious to Alec and to the others gathering around me. I kept hearing Ted's voice repeating, her and me. Suddenly everything had fallen into place and the place had fallen apart. Suddenly everything had meaning and became meaningless. When Ted repeated her and me for the third time, everything flashed through my mind simultaneously. Tina talking about leaving, just me and you and Ted. Jose telling me, sure, there are couples, lots of them. There's hardly anything else. Ted's nightly visits to Tina's in my room. When I thought he looked in on me, I concluded that he found me attractive. It now dawned on me that the only time he really looked at me or spoke to me was when I squatted alongside Tina, when I looked her size and seemed her age. Her and me, just me and you and Ted. You're my mother, aren't you? The mother of Ted's seven-year-old bride. And where was the honeymoon to be? Not in Sabina's world, where nothing is banned, everything is allowed, no holds are barred, but in the world I came from, the world where all relationships are funny. But why me? Why not Sabina? Because she'd bring Tissy, and Seth and the rest of the crew, and the honeymoon wouldn't even be as private as the lofts by Sabina's laboratory. He might even ask you to kill me, Sabina had told me. I wouldn't bring anyone along. I'd be a far better front for Ted's funny relationship than Ted's garage ever was for Seth's heroine. It was no longer a question of not imposing my sensibilities. It was now a question of not being imposed on. I felt like vomiting. I couldn't keep my mind off the yet more private loft just for her and me, with yet more rigid admission requirements, with a steel door and a combination lock, with a wall-to-wall -wall down mattress for every conceivable and inconceivable perversion, in every conceivable shape, size, and age. Those were the thoughts that flew through my mind as I sat in the kitchen 11 years ago, staring at the bewildered faces surrounding me. Those are the thoughts that fly through my mind as I sit on the fender of Damon's car waiting for him and Sabina to come out of the courtroom. Four days after Tina announced, I'm leaving, I'll be staying at Ted's. Finally, Damon emerges from the courthouse alone. He sees me, waves, runs across the street, and the first thing he talks about is Tina. I didn't expect to be seeing you again so soon, and certainly not under such unusual circumstances. That fireball you keep in your house with you. Scared the hell out of you, and you deserved it. She's no longer with us. I look expectantly towards the courthouse entrance and ask him, Where's the other fireball I keep in my house with me? No longer with you. My fault, I suppose, he asks. He starts driving. Your fault, I ask. Why are you so paranoid? Where's Sabina? I told her I'd pick her up after I found out where your trial was. Couldn't you tell her on the phone? It was over before I found anything out, he says. When did you two get so chummy, I ask. You can call it chummy, he says with sarcasm. That's not what I call it. She was waiting for me after my last class with a switchblade knife. I can't keep myself from laughing. Sabina? She was playing, wasn't she? When was that? Day before yesterday, he says. If she was playing, I didn't think her game very funny. She pressed that knife to my stomach and asked, Where is she? As if I'd locked you into my desk drawer. Don't laugh, Sophie. I don't see how you can live with that woman and still be alive. She pressed the knife until I felt it. I still have a wound and demanded, Where's Sophia? What did you do with her, Professor? All right, go ahead and laugh. It was hilarious. How the hell should I know, I said, and I was sure I'd had it. That was as chummy as we got. For some reason, she spared me. She put the knife away and said, She's been kidnapped. Kidnapped, I shouted. Why would I want to kidnap her? Answer, I don't know, Professor. I can't read your mind. She was right, I shout. Right, he shouts. Still laughing, I say, she was right. You, a professor, were completely exposed in an argument. Every mask you wear was pulled off. You were shown up as a cop for capital. But a professor, a powerful member of the establishment, doesn't have to let himself be exposed like that. Certainly not by people who don't have the proper credentials. He picks up the phone and sends out a goon squad. Sophie, goddammit, you're going to walk home, he shouts. Only she had the wrong professor, I continue. But she was right. I exposed a professor in an argument, and he set out the goon squad. Hmm, he says, bristling with frustration. I just found out they had you in there for assault and battery. I also slapped him, I admit. Oh, you slapped him, he says self-righteously. Yes, oh, I slapped him, I shout. Just like I wanted to slap you when you said Yarrowstown's years in prison were equivalent to a university education. That would have justified calling the goon squad, wouldn't it? Hmm, he says again, turning onto my street. What's hmm, I ask. What happened after Sabina put her knife away? I obviously became concerned, whatever you say about professors, the entire genus. I didn't think you ever made such sweeping generalizations, he says, parking the car in front of my house. I usually don't, but Sabina does. So what happened next, I asked impatiently. 
She had me drive her to your mother's. Then she had me drive all over town looking for someone else. At one point, I suggested calling the police. She screamed, if you call the police, I know, I said, I'll get knifed. But you have to admit I was right at least about that. It would sure have saved a lot of gas. I'm grateful for all your trouble, I tell him. Would you like to come in? No, thank you, he says emphatically. My life is too precious to me. Then tell me one more thing. What do you know about that commune some students got going, I ask. Nothing much, he says. Some wild new cultural radicals have got it into their heads that they can make a revolution without the working class inside a university building. Thanks again, Damon, I say, climbing out of his car. But none of my students are involved with that, he adds, boasting. Because they're the working class, I shout. He shouts back, that's right, they're the working class. Goodbye, Sophie. Give my regards to the knife thrower and send my greetings to the fire eater. He drives off. I walk up to the door and knock lightly. No response. I pull out my key and let myself in. Still no Sabina. I walk to her room. She's sound asleep. It's not noon yet. I go up to her quietly and kiss her. She sits up abruptly and stares at me. I whisper, if you were so worried about me that you went out looking for me with a knife, why did you go back to sleep? What did you expect me to do, she asks, hugging me. March in front of the courtroom, carrying a sign and shouting, free Sophia. You couldn't have looked funnier than when you poked Damon with a knife, I say, starting to laugh again. Did he come in with you, she asks. Oh no, if he ever sees you again, he'll run as fast as he can. Both of us burst out laughing. Sabina gets up and starts dressing. What made you think I was kidnapped, I ask. Look around the living room and tell me what you have thought, she answers. I run into the living room and look around for the first time since my arrest. The rug is decorated by enormous footprints of dry mud. Under the pillow on the couch, there's a smashed record, and in front of the couch, there's a mess, a shattered lamp and a spilled ashtray next to the tipped coffee table. I try to explain the evidence to Sabina. It was pouring out when they came for me, and they probably walked around the house before they came in. One of the oafs crushed the record because I had left the pillow over it. The other one bumped into the coffee table on his way out. It was sunny and dry when I got up, but never mind, you sure would write lousy detective stories, Sabina shouts from her room. It's perfectly obvious, isn't it? Two giants crawled in through your window in the middle of the night. I know there were two because I measured the footprints. There were two different sizes. They gagged you and started carrying you out through the front door. You put up a good fight in the living room, but they knocked you out cold, threw you into a sack, and carried you away. You mean you measured their footprints, but you didn't go into my room, I ask? My pajamas were under my pillow, and my bed was made up. Some detective you make. I obviously didn't sit around here playing detective, she shouts. I went out to find you. But why Damon, I ask. Who else, she asks. And why the knife? Sophia, I... If I'd wanted a house all to myself, I would have looked for one several years ago, she shouts. Aha, I shout. Are you the one who lectured to me about possessiveness? Is it possible that somewhere along the way you've acquired a mother complex? Sabina runs into the living room and puts both her hands on my throat, gently. Say that again, smartass, she hisses through her teeth, and I'll have a home all to myself. I'll admit only one thing, she says removing her hands and turning away from me as if ashamed. I was sorry I lectured to you when you weren't here anymore. You were wrong about Tina and I was furious. But I wasn't furious enough to want you beaten and carried away. That's why the knife. Losing both of you so suddenly didn't give me time to adopt a detached, speculative attitude. But what business did you have with the police? And why didn't you tell me about it beforehand? What about your job? Come on, let's have breakfast. There are two letters for you in there. We go to the kitchen. I'm glad to be home. I open your letter first and start reading it while eating, handing Sabina each page as I finish. A born troublemaker, she comments, reckless and courageous, like all of Nachula's brood, I being his daughter, Sabina his granddaughter, and Tina his great-granddaughter. Suddenly she says, hey troublemaker, it's a beautiful day. How about spending the afternoon in the park? It really is a beautiful spring day, one of the first cloudless and warm days this year. We catch a bus near our house and ride to a bridge that leads to an enormous island park. On the bus, I tell Sabina why I was arrested, tried, and fined. She laughs at every detail and obviously doesn't respond with, Oh, you slapped him. On the contrary, she's sorry about the fact that my slaps could hardly be more than gentle pats on the professor's cheeks. I don't know how well you remember Sabina. She still looks like a gypsy, whatever she wears, and she's still smaller than I am. But over the years, she's learned every conceivable technique of self-defense and she always was terribly strong. I suspect she could easily have committed assault and battery against both of the cops who arrested me if they hadn't had guns. The behavioral psychologist would have smarted for a long time from Sabina's slaps, and then he'd really have been disappointed by the smallness of the fine. 
We get off the bus and she runs across the bridge. I walk across and I'm exhausted by the time I reach the bench where she waits for me. We've gone mountain climbing several times, but I'll strike that out. I've digressed enough already, and this is my third day on this letter. We walk to an isolated spot by the river and lie down on the grass, sunning ourselves while reading your letter. We spend the rest of the afternoon watching the birds and the passing boats and discussing your letter. Before telling you about that discussion, I'd like to tell you about the second letter that was waiting for me, so that I can at least finish telling you what happened to my teaching job. I haven't forgotten that I've left you dangling right in the middle of my experience in the garage. I'm sorry. Ten things can happen in an instant and ten thoughts can fly simultaneously through your mind, but you can only tell about one thing or one idea at a time, and that fact alone falsifies what really happened and how I really felt. The second letter that was waiting for me is from the administration of the community college. It's almost identical to the notes Alec and I received years ago from the president of the university. The main difference is that this note came by mail instead of being delivered by special courier. It only contains one line. Please report to the office of the dean at 9 a.m. Friday. How quickly that note came. The assault and battery trial in my interview with the dean must have been planned at the same time and by the same people. I show the note to Sabina and she responds by giving me advice. Next time you want to slap someone, clench your fist. Not like that. Fold your thumb on the outside like this. She shows me. I arrive at the dean's office on Friday morning half an hour late. I usually get up at 9. Since I knew more or less what was going to happen, I thought I was making enough of a concession by setting my alarm for quarter to nine. The interview with the dean isn't nearly as congenial as my early interview with the president. The first difference is that the dean is nervous and rude, not at all the smooth politician the president was. It's through this dean that I got the job. He makes public displays of his liberalism and is a great friend of Damon's whenever they're both visible to others. Damon had recommended me to him. The second difference is that there is a hostile presence in the room, the behaviorist. And lest I forget, no coffee is served, although the hour would warrant it. Sophia, the dean starts out, I must confess that I am at once surprised and disappointed. So, I ask, shrugging my shoulders. This proceeding is highly irregular, he says, fidgeting with some papers on his desk. Please come to the point, I say. I really don't have all day. Lifting some of the papers, he says, I have a report here. I grab the report out of his hands and the psychologist starts running towards me. Am I not allowed to read a report about me, I ask, clutching the papers. The liberal dean shoves his arm in the psychologist's path and says, Surely Sophia is entitled to read the report. But it's the only copy, the behaviorist shouts with amazing psychological insight. The dean keeps his arm between the predator and his prey and assures me, You may study the report if you wish. Liberalism, authority granting its victim the right to live a minute longer. Turning my back to the frustrated behaviorist, but listening attentively for every move he might make, I leaf through the report. It's a medical report, or rather a mental report, about the state of Sophia Nachalo's health. And it concludes that the subject is urgently in need of care, unbalanced with strong symptoms of psychosis, disposed to acts of extreme violence, and not only unfit to teach, but socially dangerous as well. In short, a witch, I announce. Pardon me, the dean asks. The accuser, the judge, and the executioner are all one and the same person. How does that fit into your political philosophy, I ask the liberal dean. Of course you are entitled, he starts. Oh, am I, I ask with mock enthusiasm. In that case, I'd like my own defense attorney. Expenses to be paid by the institution. I'd like a trial by jury, and I'd like the right to examine my jury to make sure my accusers aren't sitting in judgment over me. The liberal dean is really nervous now, and his free hand fidgets with everything on his desk. You're entitled, yes, of course, a review board will have to be appointed, surely. While the dean fishes for words, I fish for the lighter in my purse. I'm grateful for the noise the dean makes, both with his mouth and his hands, and also for the numerous disappointments with which he threatens to frustrate the behaviorists. All four corners of the report are on fire before either of them smell what's happening to the only copy. The trial is over, she's a witch, burn her, I shout as I throw the report on the dean's paper-laden desk. Before leaving, I start laughing. The laughter is the crowning touch. It must really sound demonic to them. Neither of them moves to put out the fire on the dean's desk before I leave the room. That afternoon, Damon calls. His friend, the dean, told him everything. Gee, I just heard. I didn't think you'd lose your job, Sophie. That's terrible. I'll be right over. The hypocrite. He talks about working class revolutions from morning to night. But losing an academic job is terrible. That's serious. The job is the only thing in life that really matters. He refused to come into the house after such a trivial event as my arrest, but now he rushes over. 
Sabina had laughed until she'd ache when I told her I'd burned part of the dean's office as well as the only copy of the document that proved me to be a maniac. Damon doesn't laugh. He fidgets, like the dean. His hands mechanically leaf through the stack of paper on the coffee table. They're the pages of your letter. Do you really think you helped your cause by doing that, Sophie? In every conceivable way, I answer. I've regained all the self-respect I lost when I accepted that job. I've regained my time. I didn't demean myself. And I was so proud of myself when I walked out of that room that I felt three feet taller. This is a serious matter, Sophie, and I'm not joking, he says. Neither am I. For you, it's not a serious matter to kiss the dean's ass. It is for me, I shout. You won't easily find another job like that, he says, threatening never to recommend me again. I won't ever look for another job like that, I assure him. You can keep them all yourself. Still fidgeting with your letter, but never once looking at it, he asks, Is this a novel you're working on? No, I tell him. It's another letter from my friend Yaristan. He drops your letter as if it too had been burning. Well, I guess I'd better be shoving along, he announces. I'll read you parts of the letter, I suggest. I told Yaristan about you, and he said some really interesting things about professors and journalists. You'll be fascinated. I'd rather not, he says. The idea of the worker's backwardness pervades his whole argument. He doesn't understand that the working class is inherently... Sabina cuts Damon short. Until now, she stayed out of the conversation in deference to me. With Tina gone, the circle of my friends is diminishing. But now she leaps in front of Damon and snaps her fingers in his face. Are you alive, Professor? Or are you some type of robot? I better be shoving along, Damon repeats uneasily. You said that before, too, Sabina reminds him, blocking his path. I've always wondered how you professors manage to say the same thing with the same tone year after year. Now I know. You've got a phonograph installed in your throat. Open your mouth and let me see, Professor. I've never seen a phonograph that could fit into a man's throat. But what happens to you? How does it feel? Don't you feel frustrated when you hear someone ask you one thing and your throat answers something else? Sophia told you Yaristan had things to say about professors and journalists, not about backward workers. Does the academic phonograph kit include earplugs? They must be absolutely perfect plugs. Let me see your ear. What about your eyes, Professor? Can you see us standing here? Or is your vision plugged up too? Damon looks uneasily at the door, then at Sabina and me. I suggest, here's the phone, you could call the police. Sabina steps out of his way. Damon glares at me and then bolts through the door. You wrote that the political militant, the journalist, and the academician couldn't help establish a human community because their very existence presupposed the absence of community. I don't disagree. Damon is all three in one, and he's all the proof I need. I also agree with what you say about the context Damon moves in. It's a desert, and nothing human can grow there. But I'm not sure all this applies to the people I met on the university newspaper staff 15 years ago. I'm not even sure it applies to Damon as he was then. You seem to assume that once people have chosen their context, they've chosen once and for all. They can't get out of it. They can't change. You certainly make your argument convincing by citing the case of Vera Nice and of Adrian Povershan. Once they chose their starting point, they seemed to have gotten on an express train which didn't stop until it reached its final destination. The people with whom I spent over three years on the newspaper staff didn't exhibit such demonic consistency. If I had tried to guess then where all those people would end up, I would have missed every single time. The only genuinely professorial type among us was Hugh, the liberal editor, the one who claimed to have no views of his own because there were always two equal and opposite views of every problem. Yet he's the one who wound up with the down and outs, and the last time I saw him, he expressed an anti-professorial attitude very similar to yours, and lived it. As for Damon, at that time I thought no one less likely to become a professor. He was so totally dependent on Minnie for everything he professed that I couldn't have imagined him addressing a classroom all by himself. Of course, I can trace the basic continuity of his character today, but only through hindsight, only because the basic starting point would be what he is today, not what he was then. I could do that just as easily if he were a bank clerk today or a street cleaner. With the end point as the basis, we can trace the origin of anything back to the beginning of time. Surely that's not all your argument boils down to. I'm moved to tears when I read your description of the role of journalists in the Magarna uprising, spreading their reportages between like and like, interpreting each to the other, portraying each to the other through a glass that didn't reflect the experience of the individual on the other side, but only the reporters. That's horrifying, I agree. And that's what I was at the time, a reporter. That was my context, my world. But when I think about what you're telling me, I can't help rebelling. It all makes so much sense when you refer to your past experience. But does it make any sense at all when you apply it to mine? 
Are you really sure I would have been a reporter if I had been in your world at the time of that uprising? Are you really sure you'd have been miles away from the university newspaper if you'd been in mine? Those are senseless questions, but it's you who raised them. You tell me, it's only when you descend among those who are nothing in this society that your search becomes meaningful as a struggle against this society. Until then, my search was a search for a corpse. I come alive only on the day when I move into the house behind the garage. And of course, that's where you would have been all along. You say so. The garage in which Sabina and her friends lived is an environment far more familiar to me than the world of the university or the newspaper. Your descent is a descent to my world. Those are the activities I confronted, the people I've known. Yet you describe my world as exotic. Exotic. That's the exact word for it. That's exactly how I experienced it. Just like a tourist, I kept my distance. I didn't become involved until I was threatened personally, even physically. You're right about my detachment. You know perfectly well that my social origins weren't responsible for it. Was my experience in the carton plant responsible for that detachment? Or my three years in the university? Was I really so determined by my starting point, whenever I reached it, that I couldn't have made myself someone like Tissy? Was it really my search for a corpse that made the people in Sabina's world exotic to me? Are you really so sure the house behind the garage wouldn't have been exotic to you, every bit as exotic as it was to me and Alec? I'm not asking rhetorical questions. I'm asking questions I couldn't answer for myself then and can't answer for you now. In many ways, I did find in the garage something that was profoundly meaningful as a struggle against this society. If I hadn't found that there, I wouldn't have stayed as long as I did. I would have walked out with Alec the day I figured out what Ted was. I didn't only stay there. I didn't ever decide to leave. In the end, I was carried out. I did find the experience meaningful, more meaningful than all the other experiences in my life lumped together. Yet once I left, I suppressed every detail of that experience from my memory, and I went on suppressing them for 10 years. I haven't given one thought to Ted, Tissy, or Seth until only a few days ago, when Tina announced she was moving in with Ted. If all those events were so meaningful to me, why did I repress every trace of them so thoroughly? Was it really because I belonged to that other alien and hostile and inhuman world, the world of the academics and journalists? I don't think so, but I'll let you be the judge. Since Tissy's world is already familiar to you, I have no reason to spare you any of the details, do I? Since my experience was so meaningful, I have no reason to be ashamed of any of it, nor to continue repressing it. But I wonder if you'll be able to tell me just what is so familiar to you about my experience, and just what it all meant. That's the one detail I still can't provide. I wanted very much to run out of that kitchen with Alec 11 years ago, to move in with them, to get away from that world where nothing is banned, no holes are barred, for her and me, the world of wall-to-wall -wall mattresses for every conceivable shape, size, and age. But I sat at the kitchen table, surrounded by faces I failed to recognize, until Alec's voice roused me. What's the matter with Sophie, he was asking Ted. Is she on heroin? Is that what you're trying to tell me, buddy? Ted backed away from Alec and I jumped out of my chair at Ted, determined not to let him repeat her and me one more time. Get out of this room, I hissed. Get out of my sight, you're disgusting. For an instant, Ted froze where he stood and glared at me, his face expressing bewilderment more than anger. Then he turned around and slowly walked out of the room. As soon as Ted was gone, Tina ran up to me, bawling, and started to beat my chest and my stomach with her powerful fists until I cried out from pain. She asked, what's the matter with you? Why do you hate Ted so much? What did he ever do to you? I could see the same question on Tissy's face and also on Jose's. I sank back into my chair, rested my head on the table between my arms and cried. Tina walked out of the room sobbing. Tissy stomped out. Jose stayed but said nothing. Alex stroked my hair as if to comfort me. I pushed his hand away. Jesus, Sophie, what was that all about? Alec asked. Are you on heroin? No, goddammit, I shouted. I'm not on heroin. You're the only dopes in this room. I was furious at both of them for being so blind, so dense, for thinking there was something wrong, not with Ted, but with me. I'm sorry, Sophie, Alec said awkwardly. Maybe it wasn't such a good idea for me to come here. What are you sorry about? I bellowed at him. Jesus Christ, Sophie, don't start shouting at me now. I'm sorry about everything. You, the heroine, this place. I don't know what to think. First, you make this place sound great, and you make me feel like a jerk. You tell me about street people raising themselves up with their own forces, running their own lives, showing others that it can be done, and showing how. That's just great. That's something I'd like to be part of. Then this guy starts telling you about prostitution, about selling heroin, and about taking it. And then you collapse like you're having a fit. I think that guy is right, and I don't see why you chewed him out. I don't think prostitution is great, and I don't think heroin is great. 
And if you're not having a heroin fit, I'd like to know what the hell you're having and why you collapsed when he said it isn't great. Maybe you're right, Alec, I said weakly. Maybe this wasn't a good day for us to meet. Maybe I should have gone to your place. Jose jumped when I said this, but quickly turned his face away when he saw I'd noticed. Looking right at Jose, I added, maybe we should go to your place right now. But Alec let himself be carried away by his socio-political program now that he realized he had one. Why don't you answer me, Sophie? If you're not on heroin, what do you want? Do you think I'd take you home in the shape you're in? These people probably know how to take care of you if you have another fit. You know that I don't know shit about that. I don't even know any doctors. Why don't you go home then, I suggested. Why did you do it, Sophie, he continued. Was it because they threw you out of that co-op? Why bother yourself about that? You yourself admit it was nothing but a whorehouse, an establishment whorehouse. Was it because they kept you off that omissions rag? It wouldn't be the first time you did something like this. I remember that time you had some resentment against Rhea or Lem, and you took it out on them by getting a date with that idiot Rakshas. That was some novel way to spite somebody, to go to a military dance with a playboy from the suburbs. And that time it worked. Lem and Rhea dropped their golden apple as if they'd bitten into a worm. But what are you doing now? Is this your way to spite that omissions crew? Don't you know omissions is all over and done with? That it's absolutely dead, part of the forgotten past. I called them when I couldn't find you, every one of them except Rakshas. They've all graduated and they're all into other stuff now. Not a one of them talked about starting up that paper again. You're not making any point, don't you see that? And that shit about street people raising themselves up? Jesus, Sophie, by becoming pimps? By selling morphine? That's not a way to raise themselves up. That's the way they just dig themselves further under. With his last comments, Alec invited Jose into the conversation. How did you pay for that suit, mister? Jose asked. Did your rich papa buy it for you? Alec got hysterical. Who the hell is he, your pimp? Jose would have knocked Alex across the room if I hadn't run between them and shouted at Alec. Either be civil or get out this very minute. Jose is your host, and if you don't apologize to him, I'll... I didn't finish. I was going to add, I'll let him beat you to a pulp, but I realized that only Jose could decide to do that. Alec amazed me by reaching his hand up to Jose. I'm sorry, Jose, I didn't mean that. Jose refused to shake Alec's hand. Alec added, still holding out his hand, you struck a sensitive spot. I hated my old man. I walked out on him and haven't seen him for at least six years. Jose suddenly shook Alec's hand and said, no shit, I walked out on my old man eight years ago. Turning to me, Jose said, I mean, Ron's old man. I looked at him curiously, but he didn't explain. He turned to Alec again and added, that gives us two things in common. Two, what's the second, Alec asked. Sophie, Jose answered. Sophie, I thought. So I was no longer Ron's girl. I blushed until my cheeks burned, but said nothing. Of course, Alec took that up. Christ, Sophie, you mean you and this Jose? You mean you two? I hurriedly cut him short. He's my host and that's all, Alec, understand? No, he insisted. I don't understand. A little earlier, you were asking me to be your host. Fortunately, Sabina walked into the kitchen just then, and I didn't have to deal simultaneously with Alec's outburst of jealousy and Jose's sudden confusion. What's this? Sabina asked, studying Alec in his suit. The circus? He's my friend Alec. Alec, my sister Sabina, I said. This is your sister? Are you serious? I mean, I never knew you had a sister, Alec said, literally ravaging Sabina with his eyes. Sophia is your friend, is she? Sabina asked him. Yes, he answered, completely off guard. She's my best friend. How about Tissy? Is she your friend too? Sabina asked. I don't understand what you mean, Alec said. Anything in a skirt is your friend. Isn't that so, Mr. Alec? Sabina asked. Jose started to laugh, but stopped as soon as Sabina turned to him and whispered, Oh, you're an altogether different kind of fish, aren't you? Alec turned to me with a helpless expression. He'd already forgotten his recent jealousy. Grateful to him, at least for that, I said to Sabina, but he's all right in spite of that. Alec stuck his arm out to shake Sabina's hand, saying, Sophie and her friends here have been telling me about your establishment, or your house. Sabina turned her back on him and walked to the stove. Suddenly she faced him, coquettishly pulled her skirt above her knee and said, you obviously like them short, thin but not skinny, preferably with pitch black hair. They're the most expensive types. How much can you pay? Alec stared at her with disbelief, or was he weighing her proposition? Suddenly he made up his mind, turned to me, and started shouting, Jesus, Sophie, what the hell were you telling me about being a carpenter and a mechanic? Your sister, do you take me for a complete jerk? Jesus Christ, why did you have to go and get into this? Pimps, prostitute, and dope addict? Why? Jose tensed up again, but Sabina was far ahead of him. How do you spend your time, Reverend Alec? 
I work in a factory like thousands of others, Alex shouted proudly. Not thousands, Reverend. Millions, she corrected. That's an ultra-respectable way to spend your time, since millions do that. We spend our time discussing our own projects and carrying them out. Why don't you do that to your time, Reverend? Ah, uh, get off it, Alec pleaded. To earn my living, that's why. In other words, you sell yourself, Sabina asked. What the hell do you do, Alec asked. How often do you work in a factory, Reverend? She pursued him relentlessly. Six days a week, like most everyone else, he answered reluctantly. Day or night, she asked. I said six days. Prostitute, Sabina shouted. What are you calling me? Alec asked, dumbfounded. Prostitute, Sabina responded. You sell yourself during six of your seven living days. Do you think any of us does that? I sell myself for half an hour, and at night, all I lose is a little of my sleep, and I don't sell one second of my living day. Prostitute, you sell all there is to you, every living day, six days a week, during your living day. You sell yourself and you sleep. What did you call me, Reverend? I didn't hear you. Alec had started backing away from Sabina, and before she finished, she had bolted through the door. No one tried to stop him. I remained seated and thought I'd let that be my last encounter with Alec. But I remembered Ted's her and me and changed my mind. I caught up with him in the garage and we walked out together. I can't deal with it, Sophie, he said as soon as we were in the street. I thought I was radical and open-minded, but I can't take any of this in. It doesn't seem right to me, although she makes it all sound right. And I can't tell you why it doesn't seem right. Maybe she's got me all figured out. She sure looked right through me. You look pretty hard yourself, I reminded him. Oh, come on, he said, smiling a little. She sure saw that right away. Is she really your sister? Sure sounds like it when she runs her mouth, but I can't take it in. Like she says, I talk about exploitation and revolution, and when the time comes to do something every goddamn morning, I baa like a sheep. He paused, took my hand in his, and asked, You're not really a heroin addict, are you, Sophie? Nor a prostitute. I'd like to see you again, Alec, I told him, letting him kiss me. I'd like to believe it, he whispered. Well, I hope you're able to, I shouted sarcastically, pulling myself away from him and starting to return to the garage. What should I tell your mother, he asked. Tell her I'll call her. No, tell her I'm a dope addict. Tell her I'm a slut in a whorehouse. Tell her to go to hell, I shouted, running back to the garage. How much do I owe you, he yelled back. He had the last word. I ran through the garage, past Ted and Tina, straight to my bed. Alec's visit resolved absolutely nothing for me. I had hoped his outside perspective would at least give me a clue as to how I might respond to Ted, to Sabina's no-holds-are-barred, to Tina. But he'd come with nothing but hackneyed and insulting prejudices, petty jealousy, and his perennial skirt-chasing. I stayed away from Tina because I couldn't bear the thought of facing Ted, even in the workshops. For a week, I got up every morning, right after Tina left the room, and went for all-day lonely walk. I avoided Sabina as much as I could because, like Alec, I wasn't able to take it all in. I also stayed away from Jose. The cryptic confession he made during his argument with Alec excited me immensely, but it also frightened me. When I thought of him, the idea that everything is allowed, no holds are barred, made my heart flutter wildly. One day I even visited Debbie Matthews. She was drunk and our brief conversation wasn't very satisfactory. But it was then that I learned about poor Lamisel's fate. The international conference he'd attended had ended six months earlier and he still hadn't returned. In the meantime, the Magarna uprising had been suppressed by the tanks you described. Of course, I knew then that the letter I'd sent you probably hadn't reached its destination. By the end of the week, I was absolutely bored. I decided not to let Ted empty my life of its content. I had enjoyed my brief apprenticeship with Tina immensely. She was a marvelous teacher, and I'd loved being able to do all those different things that had always seemed so impossible to me. I resolved to regain Tina's friendship. My first attempt led to a disaster. It was exactly a week after Alec's visit. I'd gone to bed before Tina all week long. That night, I stayed awake and waited for her. As soon as she turned out the light and slipped into bed, I said, I'm sorry about what I did, Tina. I heard her breathe faster, but she didn't say anything. Do you hate me, I asked. Why do you hate Ted, she asked. I lay silently, not knowing what to say. Then I asked, doesn't he ever touch you, hurt you? Who told you that, she asked, seemed astonished. Ted can never hurt anyone. Sure, he touched me. He used to kiss me every night when I went to bed, before you came. I fidgeted with my blanket. I'm sorry I came, I said. I know I should leave, but I have nowhere to go. Silence. Suddenly, Tina sat up in her bed and whispered, Sophia, are you asleep? No, I'm not. I don't hate you, she announced. I leaped out of my bed and sat down on hers. Friends, I asked, reaching for her hand. Tina turned her face towards mine and asked sadly, Sophia, would you kiss me the way Ted used to? Where did he kiss you, I asked nervously. Here, she said, pointing to her lips. I couldn't, 
but I didn't have to. I was blinded by the room lights. Ted stood by the door with his hand on the switch. You, I shrieked hysterically. Get out of here. Jose and Tissy came running into the room and both looked bewildered when they saw me sitting on Tina's bed, holding her hand. Ted asked insinuatingly, is there something the matter with your bed, Sophie? Get out of here, I repeated, getting off Tina's bed and into mine. I don't owe you any explanations. Then Tina said to Ted, I'd have called you if she'd hurt me. She wasn't hurting me. I asked her to kiss me goodnight, like you used to. Jose and Tissy backed slowly out of the room, but Ted stayed, still trembling, glaring at me with terror and hatred in his eyes. Then he turned around and walked back to his room. Tina got up to turn the light out. On her way back to her bed, she stopped by mine and kissed me, the way Ted used to. I had won her friendship, but I lost my desire to resume my apprenticeship. I spent four more days avoiding the workshops as well as all my housemates. I rode buses to parks, taking my lunch and a novel, but I couldn't concentrate on what I read. My situation was too unresolved. I thought of leaving, but I didn't want to be anywhere else. And I knew that something in my situation had to change. Something had to come to a head. My relationship with Jose was suspended in midair. My conflict with Ted had to reach some kind of climax. My apprenticeship was bound to resume, or else I might finally be pushed into trying out Tissy and Sabina's trade. I say pushed because the one thing I wasn't going to do was the pushing. That's why I rode the buses, letting them take me wherever I went. I waited for something to happen to me, to make my decisions and choose my path for me. The perfect dilettante. And I felt perfectly self-satisfied at least about that. After all, Jose had told me on the first night that Ron's girl didn't have to do any of the work. Ron's girl didn't have to do anything at all. She had only to be present at the major ceremonies and entertain the founder's followers with her sarcastic comments. After four more days of evasion, something did change, but for the worse. That hardly seemed possible. I was already estranged from everyone in the house, but impossibility is a term of logic and reality doesn't observe the limits of logic. I said I wasn't going to spare you any of the details. I won't. I'm making no effort to separate meaningful details from meaningless ones. If I did make that effort, I doubt that I'd succeed. After all, I must have had some good reason to repress my memory of those events for ten years. They simply don't fit into the rest of my life. Yet they, too, must have done their share of making me who I am. Besides, all these details should be rich with meaning for you. You said so. They're all part of Sabina's world, the world that's so terribly familiar to you. I'm dying to get your next letter so as to learn the meaning of those experiences. Am I being sarcastic? That's my main quality, Sabina told me. Ron loved me for it. Bitter? No more now than I was then. I still can't take it all in any better than Alec could, any better than if it had happened last night. I don't know what hour of the night it was. I felt someone shaking me by the arm. I woke up and saw it was Tissy. She was trembling. I sat up and asked her what had happened. Help me, she pleaded pathetically. I'm hearing things. I'm scared. I immediately thought Ted might be hovering around her room. Then I thought she might be hallucinating. I asked what I could do. Stay with me. Just for a while, she pleaded. I climbed out of bed and accompanied her to her room. I lay down on the bed next to hers. I didn't hear any sounds. I asked Tissy drowsily, do you feel better now? Yeah, a lot better, she said, but I'm still scared. I can't sleep. What kind of sounds, I asked, but I lost interest. I fell asleep. I woke up in terror, unimaginable terror. This was no nightmare. The moment for waking up in a cold sweat had long passed. There was no other waking. I was wide awake. If I hadn't been so blind during all the weeks I'd spent in that house, if I hadn't so completely missed so many clues, if I hadn't been so completely uninformed, I wouldn't have been so surprised, so terror-stricken, so inhumanly crude. I lay on my back, stark naked. Tissy's naked body writhed over mine, her legs wrapped around me, her mouth sliding over me, licking and kissing whatever it could reach. My eyes were wide open, but my body was paralyzed. I could neither move nor cry out. With an enormous effort, I found the strength to whimper, Don't, please don't, as if she were murdering me. I kept repeating my plea mechanically as I tried to writhe away from her, moving toward the edge of the bed. Tissy put her lips on my ear and pleaded, Come on, honey, hold on just one more minute. Please hold on. But I didn't have the decency to let Tissy have her orgasm. My upbringing as a radical hadn't taught me anything about that. I reached the edge of the bed and regained control over my vocal cords. I became hysterical. No, get off me. Both of us fell to the floor. Tissy, still hugging me, cried, Be like your sister, honey. Show some feeling. Don't leave me like this. Not Sabina, my insides cried out. A cold shiver ran down my back. 
I felt like vomiting, as if to expel that thought from my system. I started crawling towards the wall, trying frantically to keep Tissy off me, repeatedly whimpering, get away from me. I couldn't believe what she was telling me about Sabina, and I ignored it. I repressed it immediately, just that I ignored and repressed everything I'd seen, heard and felt since the day I'd come to the garage. From the first day I'd been Ron's girl, and though I knew perfectly well Sabina had been Ron's girl, I'd never ask, why not Sabina? I'd never once asked myself why Tina thought I was her mother, why she didn't think Sabina could be. At the beginning of my first long conversation with Sabina, she'd kiss me on my lips and ask pointedly, do you mind? She'd recommended the bar to me on the grounds that the food was as tasty as the girls were beautiful. She, who'd called Alec a skirt chaser. When I told her Tissy had already taken me to the bar, she'd clenched her fist and exclaimed, Tissy took you? Why that little hypocrite? The meaning of that outburst was unambiguous, but I'd repressed it immediately. I couldn't let it dawn on me that Sabina was jealous of Tissy because Tissy had made the first pass at me. I couldn't let myself imagine that Sabina was furious because Tissy had betrayed her. I couldn't because I had suppressed all the clues that would have allowed me to imagine that. Just one day before Sabina's outburst, Jose had exclaimed, Sure, there are couples, lots of them. There's hardly anything else. Who were they? Not Ted and Tissy. They avoided each other like mortal foes. Ted and Tina? I didn't count that. Jose and Sabina? Not in your life, Jose had said. You never got to know your sister, did you? We were never a couple and never will be. Who then? Sabina and Tissy. Until I came. They fought over me and Tissy won the first round, but Sabina wasn't someone to be outdone, ever. She immediately gotten even with that little hypocrite. Just before taking me to the bar, she insisted I'd wear my blue jeans and work shirt, commenting, You look perfect as you are. You even smell perfect. And how proudly and spitefully she'd paraded me in front of Tissy, her arm locked in mine. That very night, she told me about love in every conceivable form and sex in every imaginable combination, position, or pattern. And that scene she'd made with Alec, bearing all her teeth the moment she'd figured out what he was to me, she'd been jealous of him. I'd repressed it, all of it, and I didn't hear what Tissy told me. I crawled frantically toward the wall. When I reached it, I pushed myself up, using all my strength to hold Tissy's body and arm's length away from me. My face contorted with fear, as if I were struggling with some terrible beast. I continued crying, I can't, get away from me. Tissy's whole body was trembling, and she started crying uncontrollably. You bitch, she said between sobs, like a badly injured and frustrated child. You filthy bitch, you do it with Sabina, you do it with Tina. What's wrong with me? I'm too low for you, is that it? I'm just a gutter sled, is that it? I'll show you how low I am. She started kicking me. As soon as I let her arms go, she started hitting me hard, hurting me. I ran toward the door. I cried hysterically, get away, you beast. How inhuman, how terribly mean. If I had heard, seen, or felt anything since the day of my arrival, I would have known that she couldn't possibly have expected me to act the way I did that she couldn't possibly have foreseen my scandalized surprise. She'd been so obliviously disgusted the morning I told her I had enjoyed sex with a man. She'd gotten her first clue as to who I must really be when she'd seen me on Sabina's bed, my lips on Sabina's cheek. I didn't know, she said, and now she knew. How had Tissy felt when Sabina had escorted me past her with a spiteful, victorious grin and her vengeful, Evening, Tissy. It was Tissy who was betrayed by her lover, and I was the instrument of that betrayal. She hated me for that. How indignantly, she said, you don't look like Sabina's sister. I was obviously her lover, her old flame. And my more recent flame's nickname must obviously have been short for Alexandra. Betrayed and alone, what could she have felt when she saw me doing it with Tina? Why was I doing it with Sabina, with Alexandra, with Tina, but not with Tizzy? Why was she being left out? What was wrong with her? How could I possibly have been so surprised? How could I have been such a monster as to cry, get away, you beast? I was altogether hysterical, on the verge of falling apart. I couldn't take any more. But more took place that night, infinitely more. I fell off a precipice into an abyss. I lost all control over myself and fell to pieces. Yet it was precisely when I reached the bottom of the abyss that I regained control over myself and held myself together on my own, if only for an instant, for the first time since I'd come to the garage. Hurting from Tissy's kicks and blows, I lunged at her, pushed her away from me, and ran out of her room, leaving her writhing on the floor, bawling. I ran straight to my room and was about to slip into my bed when I froze. What I saw, what I felt, was impossible. It simply couldn't be true. Ted was inside my bed in Tina's room. Not you, I shrieked. His eyes were wide open, 
and looked terror-stricken, exactly as mine must have looked when I'd found Tissy on top of me. My hands flew at his eyes, pulling frantically to remove the arms with which he quickly protected them, scratching his face with my fingernails. Out, I shrieked, out! I felt his blood on my hands and continued struggling to reach his face. Tina sat up, paralyzed with terror. Suddenly she leaped on Ted's bed and tried to pull my hands away from Ted's face. Don't, Sophia, she pleaded. Don't, you're killing him. Stop it. Get away, Tina, I shrieked. Don't protect him. I was absolutely wild, but Tina wouldn't let go. She clung to my wrists and kept pushing my arms away from him. I was like a trapped beast, lunging at my prey but tearing myself in my attempts to reach him. She hung on me like a dead weight, her face frozen in a grimace of unbelieving horror, her jaw moving soundlessly, incapable of articulating her plea. I ran out of the room like an injured animal, dragging Tina with me. As soon as we reached the hall, she released my wrists and rushed back to Ted's bedside. I flew across the hall to Jose's room. I was beside myself with rage and frustration. I switched on his leg, flung myself on his bed, and shook him with all my strength. Jose literally leaped out of my grasp across the room, shouting, Holy shit! I was still stark naked, but that fact didn't once cross my mind. I jumped after Jose and started tugging him out of his room. He's raping her! Help me! He's raping her! Jose looked totally bewildered as I pulled him by the arm across the hall to Tina's room. The light was on. Ted lay on my bed staring at me, the blood from the scratch on his cheek staining my pillow. Tina kneeled alongside the bed, bawling, wiping Ted's wound with a corner of my sheet. I went completely out of my mind. I started to push Jose towards the bed and screech, Kill him! Kill him! Get him out of here! Jose drew his own conclusions from the scene and once again exclaimed, Holy shit! Then he turned around, his face a grimace of disgust and contempt, and slapped my face so hard that I went reeling to the floor. He then grabbed my arm and dragged me out of Tina's room. His voice filled with revulsion. He hissed at me, You pervert! What did you ever have to do with Ron? In all those years I spent thinking you must have been some piece of ass. You sure as hell are. If I catch you molesting that kid just one more time, I'll send your ass flying so far. No, I shrieked, prostrate on my chest, my teeth biting into the rug. You're crazy. You're all crazy. Jose left me lying there exactly as I had left Tissy. Help me, I shrieked. Go to sleep in Ted's room and shut your trap, Jose shouted. That was the bottom of the abyss. I lay naked in the hallway, clawing the rug with my fingernails, biting it with my teeth. I've never fallen so low. Yet it was precisely at that point, the lowest point, that I came to myself. For the first time in weeks, I stopped worrying about Tina, and Ted vanished completely from my mind. I literally became indifferent to their relationship with each other, and I remained indifferent until the end of my stay in that house, and for ten years after that. For the first time in weeks, maybe in my whole life, I started to concentrate exclusively on myself. I was the pervert. I was the rapist, the child molester. Only four days earlier, Jose had seen me on Tina's bed, holding her hand while Tina had explained, I'd have called you if she'd hurt me. Jose had caught me in the act. I couldn't be Ron's girl or any man's. Suddenly, I knew exactly what I had to do. I rose to my feet, spat the dirt and carpet wool out of my mouth, and held my head up proudly, defiantly. I was determined not to let myself be thrown naked into the garbage dump and pushed into the river with the city's trash. The pieces all came together. I had perfect control over myself. The nightmare was over. It was my second waking. I walked straight to Jose's room and threw his door open. I felt as strong as an ox and as determined as a locomotive. No one and nothing was going to stop me from showing Jose once and for all that everything he thought about me for the past four days was as wrong as wrong could be.